My name's Nat, and today is Thursday, and every Thursday we deliver educational, fun content, free of charge to help support people understand their brains better. Now, as an organization, we are predominantly neurodivergent, myself included. I have diagnosed dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, and very likely undiagnosed dyscalculia. But not many people get diagnosed with dyscalculia. Why? Though it is its own separate condition, I would say there is like an unofficial hierarchy when it comes to neurodivergent conditions, and dyscalculia doesn't often get recognised as much. But there are also other conditions which are very similar to it, but aren't quite it. It is a spectrum, and a label is just a collection of symptoms and characteristics which we put a sticker on in order to begin a conversation. Let's not get hung up too much on that today, even though that's going to be our focus. Here's a picture of me on the BBC, just to show credibility. I do a lot of things, got new in my Masters in Neuroscience, always talking about the brain, an expert via experience, so you're in good hands. And I'm terrible at maths, even more credibility. Uh, having dyscalculia isn't necessarily about being bad at maths, as we'll find out today. Here's our lovely team. You've got myself, you've got April, we've got Daniela, we also have Jesse, our newest colleague. Our last webinar we did was on Asperger's syndrome. This wasn't about Hans, the potential Nazi who was the inspiration for the condition. It was mostly about Laura Wing, the pioneering Brit who was able to collect all the information from the 40s and in around about 91 or like late 80s, collecting it all together and what, you know what? There is a separate part of the autism spectrum that I think should have its own name. Asperger's syndrome had a really sort short history, but a really impactful history. Do check out our YouTube channel and you can learn all about the fascinating histories and all that lovely stuff. But enough about autism today. Do I have a math disorder? Maybe you don't. Today is more about thought provoking questions in order to get you thinking. Again, it's not about having a diagnosis. What I want you to do is let me know which of these are familiar to you. Have you heard of dyscalculia, aculia, hyperculia, or maths anxiety? You can select multiple if you've heard of multiple. These are going to be the ones we predominantly focus on today. There are others, but things get a little bit grey because you've got different categorised booklets and manuals on what conditions are real and which ones aren't real, which ones are recognised, which ones are tentative. This is why I picked these ones so far. This little image here basically is telling you everything is interconnected. Even though I'd be surprised if any of you were diagnosed with, say, dyscalculia, that isn't saying that you don't have it or you wouldn't benefit from the strategies which often go along with it. Okay, so we've got most people have heard of dyscalculia. Nice, that's dyslexia's cousin. They're not the same person, but they have some similarities. Ac interesting that you've not heard of that. I would very much doubt anyone has that one today. Then we've got hypercalculia. This one isn't recognised that much, but if you've heard of hyper, like, you can probably guess where that is going. And mass anxiety is a real thing. It's its own kind of separate branch of anxiety. And while we are going through today, do know that I guarantee you will have some characteristics that relate to all of these probably. This doesn't mean you have it. Normally it's about how many of these characteristics do you have, but more to what scale do you have them, how long it has impacted you, and what part of life it is interfering with. So these are key things you've got to look at, rather than just what characteristics. It's like I always say to people with the mental health angle, being depressed is normal. No, but having depression is not. You could struggle with maths, but that doesn't mean you've got a maths disorder. You could struggle with reading, doesn't mean you have dyslexia. Here's a quick quiz. What you need to do is, as you're answering these, make either a mental or a physical note on which answer you're picking. Okay, if you're picking A, pick A, B, C, and at the end, we're going to see which of these conditions you most align with. Of course, this is just a bit of fun, but I think it's a fun way to learn about these conditions. The first question is, facing a maths problem feels like, dot, which one of these do you most align with? Do we got A, 
confused by basic maths, B, unable to grasp numbers after having an injury, C, skilled at complex calculations, a bit of a human calculator, or D, you just get like crippling anxiety. Ooh, well done, LaDonna as well. Well done for guessing. All right, they're coming in hot. We've got confused by, and again, make a note of these as well. If you picked like, I don't know, C, put a little note for C. Okay, so most of you are quite handy at your maths. Yeah, not me. <laughs> but good on you. I would say, yeah, more anxious. I used to get confused by basic maths, but it's more the more complicated stuff these days. All right, number two. Managing daily numbers, such as finance, your time, day-to-day -day activities. Do you find it hard to grasp? Do you find it very challenging since you've had an injury? <laughs> Do you find it easy, barely an inconvenience? Or is it stressful, but manageable? Hopefully you'll start to see a bit of a pattern emerge. What about spatial tasks? This is maneuvering maps, assembling things, more like the visual side of maths. Do you find them hard to follow? Quick pattern recognition, so you see a map, you know what to do, or possible but anxiety inducing. I find the satellite image easier because I recognise what kind of buildings look like when it's the standard flat map I struggle with. I also always walk in the wrong direction for a minute before I realise I'm going in the wrong direction, but I'm not sure that's necessarily what this is on about. Oh, Mars says, would being confused by simple fractions and percentages be maths or more complicated? No, I think that would be maths. Anything which is mental, where you think about something without writing it down would count. Okay, we've got possible, but anxiety, nice. Okay, we've got a lot of people who are clearly good at maths today. Not bitter, not at all. That's definitely not me. Memorizing numbers or dates. Can you do them? And we're talking like, large numbers like i don't know like four or five onwards or important dates can you remember your mum's birthday i sometimes do <laughs> i do my best okay we've got oh Mari says i have to allow extra time to meet up with friends or work meetings as i know i'll be late when i know i'm lost and that's an interesting point Mari. we've got we make coping strategies right if someone was to ask you are you normally late to meetings but you are never late to meetings. You'd select no, right? Because when you're younger, you haven't learned these support strategies. Of course, you'll say, I'm always late. But as an adult, you've got to put yourself in your most natural, organic position. What would you do if you were to strip back those mechanisms you put in place? So I always turn up to a meeting half an hour early because I know I'm going to probably get lost. And... If I was to take away that half an extra and go when the average person would leave, I most certainly would be late. Oh, Stephanie says, can't remember historical dates to save my life. When did such and such war happen? I don't know. I'm always forgetting World War II. Obviously, I, I don't forget the war, but I forget the dates. 1066, Battle of Hastings. I learned that from a, a phone commercial. All right, next one. Estimating time, distance or quantities. How are you finding it? Is it difficult with estimations like, oh, you know, about a mile away or so, or oh, yeah, maybe 10 centimetres? Is it unaffected unless you were recently impaired? A bang to the noggin? Quick and accurate estimations? Or avoid due to anxiety? When someone says, how high is that? I'm not even going to attempt that. No, interesting. Yeah. Again, keep a note of all of these. Now, what is your most common letter? Did you get mostly A's, mostly B's, mostly C's, or mostly D's? Okay, LaDonna's got mostly C's. And Mary, if you forget names after being told them, that's the difference between you've got your working memory, your short memory, and your long-term memory. That is quite a common characteristic of those who are ND. Okay, mostly C, you smarty pants. No one says B, which again, I am not surprised about because... That is acquired, which is something you develop later in life, where the rest of these are developmental things that are with you throughout your life. Now, what did we all get? And when I reveal it, remember, I'm not diagnosing you, just a fun exercise. If you got mostly A's, it's possible dyscalculia. This is struggling with numbers. No one got mostly B's, but had you have done it, it would have indicated aculia. This is essentially acquired dyscalculia. This is like post-injury. 
while it is very different in terms of how it came about, it presents itself in a very similar way to the developmental ones, and thus the same support strategies could also be beneficial. When we got mostly C's, which a lot of you did, that suggests hypercalculia. This is exceptional numerical ability. If you ever heard of Savant Syndrome, those who are ridiculously talented, that is also a condition. Now you might think, why would that be a condition if it's all positive sunshine and rainbows? It's not. Typically, when we talk about the spiky profile, we have some things we are good at, some things we are not so good at. Now, when you have hyper something, those spikes are, are really noticeable. You might be ridiculously good at remembering numbers and dates, but there'll be like independent living you may really struggle with. It, it, it's more about the extremes. With these, possible mathematical anxiety. This is when you have fear, stress. It's also known as mass phobia. Does writing numbers backwards fit into any of these categories? Yes, it does. If it is only numbers you write backwards, because the brain uses essentially different parts to process numbers and words. Another condition which is worth looking at is dysgraphia, because dysgraphia does have a lot of links when it comes to the writing of the numbers. Does both numbers and letters. Again, that's very common to have more than one. We got, oh, is there a chance that if someone is hyperlexic and they have a higher chance of having hypercalculia as well? For example, I'm the only one that remembers everyone's birthday in my family, and I'm sure it's because of the autism. We do know that autism is more closely linked to hyperlexia, and the hyperlexia is linked to dyslexia. So, very possible. However, it should be noticed there is very little research on hypercalculia. It is more a term used to describe exceptional abilities rather than a term used to actually diagnose. What else we've got? I'm autistic, but I have ADHD. The only thing I didn't select C. Oh, yeah. Okay, interesting. Oh, 50 50. The thing I wanted you to take away from this is that each kind of different condition, while they may look quite similar in terms of the end destination, how you get to them is quite different. Mass differences. In a nutshell, it's calculia, difficulties in learning, arithmetic, symbols, comprehension. This is, you know what, I can read it, I can see it, but how my brain is processing it isn't lining up to the expected outcome. The loss of math abilities, quite often it is someone who is able to do maths, has an injury, no longer able to do maths. Hypercalculia, exceptional. When I say exceptional, exceptional. Maybe you're able to do mental arithmetic at a ridiculously young age. However, other areas of your life just didn't develop in the same way. Maybe you might be what they call a Schumann calculator and you'll be like, what happened this day 10 years ago? You'll be like, I know exactly what happened. Mathematical anxiety, fear or stress when facing maths tasks. Sometimes people will confuse the anxiety of maths with a condition and not always the case. We all get anxious when doing something, but is that anxiety completely debilitating? Does it interfere with day-to-day -day activities? That is when we'd be looking at it. Let's just do a little bit of quick history, because history is fun. In ancient times, we had early observations. Then 40s or 50s, dyscalculia was first introduced, but no one used it. In the 70s, you know what? That's a good label, actually. We should probably use that. People started to acknowledge it and support it. In the 80s to 90s, we're getting a lot smarter now. We are really advancing our understanding. Let's face it, dyscalculia has always taken a backseat. 2000s to now, we are focusing on tailored interventions and early detections. Rather than being what we'd call a firefighter, with someone who's actively trying to make sure things don't catch on fire to begin with. We are much, much better than we ever have been in history, but we still have a long way to go, particularly in the education system when it comes to understanding these. So let's do a little bit of a deep dive on the four that we've talked about. Dyscalculia, essentially, it's, we've got a triad here. Number sense is our understanding of numbers. Then we've got math operations. Once you've got the numbers, what are we meant to be doing with them? Timesing, plusing, dividing. Then we've got mathematical solving problems. If you have difficulties in all of these for a considerable amount of time that impact your life in a substantial way, 
That is what we would call dis- If you ever wondered, dis just means different. Let's say in Latin, why not? And we've got lexia, as in dyslexia, reading. Dis, calculia, as in maths and concepts. I remember it like calculia as in like calculator, but it just stands like calculations. Then we've got graphia, as in like graphite, pencil, writing. And then praxia, which is coordinations, as in dyspraxia. These are all related. They, I would say again, hypercalculia, probably more related to autism, if anything. I say related like some sort of family tree, things in common. So here's a question related to dyscalculia. Do you struggle to compare numbers like determining if 3 is bigger than 5? This is a really classic example of this because clearly 5 is bigger than 3. But is your brain reading it that way? If you're doing really rapid firing, this is something that it's all with a neurodevelopmental condition you may struggle with. As you can see here, if a, le if a number is physically bigger, you may say it's the bigger one. The second one, 3 comes after 5, so maybe it's bigger and it's physically bigger. 3 and 5, okay, now it's going to take a bit of processing time. Our brains take additional information in order to complete the task, even if that additional information isn't overly helpful. Any of you who are in like teaching positions, the font we use, the size we use does actually make a difference in our level of comprehension. Next question, do you find basic addition or subtraction hard without using your fingers? Remember what I said about the our brain will use multiple forms of information in order to complete a problem. Now, the previous example was a negative way, but this way is positive. We've got fingers, so we're using fingers and our minds, and together we're able to lessen the cognitive load, which allows us to get to the outcome we want to. If you aren't using your fingers, you're putting all that energy into the mental maths. I consider it like, in your some people's heads are allowed to hold on to information while working on others, where for me, I only have one hand in my head. If it's holding onto one bit of information, I'm not able to remember or grab anything else. Okay, we've got, dis is a root word for bad. Greek origin, dystopia, dysfunction. Are you sure it's exactly bad though? Because I thought it was just different, but you might be right. Do you know which font slash sides are best for comprehension? Stephanie, that's a good question. So for dyslexia, fonts which are, each letter is distinctive from one another. You don't want ones which are too similar, a B or a D. Do they look distinct enough? Also, having a big enough gap in between of them so the brain can see each letter as an individual letter rather than blurring them together. Also, making sure that there is that the contrast isn't too like black and white. For instance, maybe like slightly off white a bit can really help. Avoid things with like flicks and flurls, like a big like flowery font. Yeah, or aerial fonts, sans sheriffs. Absolutely. When I was younger, I used to literally get my feet out to count them as well because I wasn't able to visually another hand or be like, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I had to get multiple pinkies. On this one, this is an example of the types, the kind of unofficial subcategories of dyscalculia. Verbal in terms of speaking numbers, somatic, visual spatial, logical spatial, graphical, numerical. None of these are official, by the way but they are useful in understanding how your brain processes numbers and what areas you may want to put a little bit more focus on. Do you ever have trouble remembering phone numbers, places, price and dates? Absolutely. I've had my same number now for 15 years. I still don't know it. I think I know the last number in it. This is the brain really struggling because the way it remembers things is like flat images and this isn't working. On the left here we've got the spiky wheel and this shows you that while there are all different things like measurements, remembering symbols and numbers and patterns and times and shapes and weights and estimizations, we all have different spikes. Some things we're really good at, some things we're not really good at and everyone's profile is going to look a little bit different. But if there is more or less a few similarities that is when you'd get a diagnosis. One person with dyscalculia is different from another person with dyscalculia. Calculia is it is a learning disability. It doesn't get away from the inherent difficulties of your brain having to perform multiple processes. It is something you can improve upon. 
struggles with basic concepts. You might be very intelligent, but struggle with numberings, maths, uh, calculations, subtractions. Challenges in daily maths. This is not something that affects you only when you're doing the most hardest of things, but day-to-day -day life a requires an assessment. You do need to get an official diagnosis in order to get like a little badge. This little iceberg, I think, is a useful way to understand that when we think of dyscalculia, you just think bad at maths, but it's not. Dyscalculia is struggling with number sense. It can result in anxiety. It can make graphs difficult to interpret. Budgeting can be very hard. Logical thinking, spatial skills, time management, sequencing. There is so much more below the surface. The next one, let's just say acquired dyscalculia. This is when someone can't work with numbers or maths, often because of a brain injury or birth-related nerve issue. This can actually be developmental. It can actually affect you from birth, but it's more to do with nerve issues in the central nervous system. Most people tend to have this later in life. I don't know, a car accident or something like that. Here's some quick questions. Have you lost the ability to perform maths calculations that you were able to do before? Can you no longer do it? This is something if you would do. If you're realizing that after having an accident, you're struggling with things, go to your GP. Do you find it difficult to recognize numbers or understand what they represent? So maybe you see the symbol plus or minus and you're like, oh God, I'm not sure what that is. Even though you have learned it previously. We're not talking about symbols you've never seen before. We're talking about symbols that you have seen. You just really struggle to recall that information. With Aculia, trouble with maths due to brain injury or birth related. Can't do calculations or understand numbers well often results from brain damage or cognitive nervous system defects and once again it affects everyday number tasks. So all of these things you only ever get diagnosed if it's something which affects your day-to-day -day life. Do you find yourself solving complex mathematical problems in your head faster than others? Yep or some people can some people can't. That is an example of Hypercalculia. The next one for hypercalculia is can you easily remember or recall large numbers or complex equations? Genuinely research savant syndrome and look at some examples of Kim Peaks and other famous savants. Their memory for numbers is mind boggling. If you can, maybe you have it. But it's not all great because again, some people think, okay, so you're a savant. Does that not mean you're a genius? In some areas, but it's, you never get it in all areas. It's one particular spike as opposed to overall. Yes, LaDonna, but like those people who can recall all the pi digits. I don't know, two, three. I, I probably get stuck after a double digits. Oh, Mary says, prime numbers have thrown me all my life. Even trying to get online, help with my daughter's homework. And yeah, do you know what? I'm all about the edible pie. The rest I'm not that keen on. When we are looking at hypercalculia, Again, it's a term which more research is needed. This is a brain without it. This is a brain with it. You can see that the tissue is very noticeably different. Exceptional math skills and number understanding and are exceptional here, not just good. Quick calculation, strong memory, basically someone's able to answer without even seemingly having to think about it. Some people can't do math in the head. Other people are just able to answer it. Shows advanced maths interest from a young age. Maybe you learn concepts much easier. Maybe you take more of an interest. With these hyper conditions, typically they peter out in later life, but not always. Oh yes, just like Matilda. I would say Matilda from Roald Dahl did have hypercalculia. We've got grass, mass concepts faster than most, applies mass effectively in various areas. So we're not just talking daily life, we're talking all areas. We're on to the last one, mass anxiety. And you might think, why would we put an anxiety in the list? Actually, anxiety can be very debilitating. And some people will not even want to go to the shops because they don't want to kind of exchange money. They won't go to the banks because it's overwhelming. They won't even look at like the bills because like it also is known as a mass phobia and problems that can affect daily life and school. Do you feel anxious or nervous when you have to do maths? Yes or no? Now, before you answer this, remember, we all feel anxious sometimes, but I'm talking, is this like all the time? And is this ridiculous levels of anxiety which stops you from fulfilling your life? 
Yeah, there we are. Now we're being a little bit more honest. Do you try to avoid tasks or situations that involve maths? Yes or no? If a little bit of maths comes up, if I'm in like a room and someone says, oh, what's that? I wouldn't even bother answering. Every time we're doing a quiz or like some sort of games and I'm just like, let someone else do it. I am not going to be the banker in Monopoly. But apart from that, I just really struggle with the kind of the quickness of it. Have any of you ever played the game Risk? What a fun game. But you have to do maths quite quick. And I really do struggle with that aspect. Okay, interesting. Do you experience physical symptoms like sweating or racing heart when dealing with maths? So again, this isn't just a mental thing. Physically, it's having an impact. Your heart starts beating. You start sweating. Or you start maybe shaking. Classic example of anxiety disorder. Remember, feeling anxious and having anxiety disorder, they're different. One is normal, one is not. A quick summary of mathematical anxiety. Stress and fear from maths tasks, avoidance, discomfort, low confidence. It can impact your school performance. It can often stem from experience, environmental factors rather than biological factors, where the others are biological. Expert evaluation, as always, is needed. If you have any of these conditions, or you think you have these conditions, do know in the UK you are eligible to support in the workplace. We have workplace needs assessments, and essentially we can get equipment, support, strategies, training, all this lovely stuff. Do not feel that you have to suffer in silence, if you are at all. Always know that the support that we are able to give as an organisation isn't dependent upon an official diagnosis. If you resonate with the challenges and you would benefit from the solutions, you're welcome and you can. Oh, but Anna, what if you're self-employed and in Wales? Good for you. We like Wales and you can absolutely do it. If you're self-employed, even better. Super easy if you're self-employed. If you're in Scotland, slightly different process. In Northern Ireland, I don't know, mate, you're on your own. They also have their own process. If you're outside of the UK, speak to your government or you come to us to do support here are some lovely references any questions from you lovely people ask now or forever hold your peace on mass difficulties or differences or disabilities or disorders whatever you want to call them i'm gonna say you know what matt you answered everyone's questions is there an official company slash rep to diagnose this officially Ugh, no Essentially, it's like the Wild West of diagnosis. Most people who diagnose are freelancers and will do it either as an independent. And this is why the prices vary dramatically. You've got first option, go to the NHS. Be on the waiting list for the rest of your life. Second option, go private and you may pay a lot of money. And they also may have an incentive to diagnose you rather than not because of the monetary exchange or free does it even matter if I have something official or not? If I know I'm struggling and I can get support for it, does it really matter? What's your company called again? <laughs> Exceptional Individuals. We're a social enterprise based in the UK that supports people to understand their brains better and to work with organisations to be more inclusive and to harness different talent everywhere. So yeah, do check us out. Exceptional Individuals. I think that was all of them answered. Oh, company. Should have checked that later. <laughs> No worries, Stephanie. I like that. Now, our next webinar is on the 4th of April. Visual dyslexia is the next one. Again, visual dyslexia isn't an official term, but it's a useful kind of fake subtype in order to understand how your dyslexia may affect you, opposed to how other people experience dyslexia. If you thought today was interesting, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Dyscalculia. We also have some videos on dyscalculia. Robbie Williams has dyscalculia. Get away. He does. We have quite a few other ones. So do check them out. Uh, da, da, da. We have an online neurodiversity test. So you can actually test yourself if you have dyscalculia. Here's our contact details if you want to get in touch. Exceptionalindividuals.com to find all our fun stuff online. Or drop us an email at admin at exceptional individual. All right, we're done. And time to spare. That is great. All right, everyone, I hope you found that interesting, useful, and got some little nuggets of information out of it. And hopefully I'll see you in future webinars. And uh, have a good rest of your Thursday, even if it's raining like it is here. Bye, everyone. <laughs>